Good morning and welcome to Salisbury Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you are here, that you have chosen to come and be a part of our Good Friday service. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us online, I'm glad that you've come to be a part of our time together as we reflect on the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Over the past few weeks, we have been following Jesus on his road to the cross. And although we look forward to the day of resurrection, the day of celebration, which is Easter Sunday, we must not rush past the cross to get to the empty tomb. For at the center of our faith, at the center of our salvation, is Jesus Christ and the cross. And that is why we gather here today to reflect on Jesus and his work through the cross. We have so much to learn from Jesus. For as Paul describes it in Philippians 2, who being in very nature God, did not <coughs> consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. As we remember and reflect on the cross, may we recognize and embrace the truth of God's deep, deep love for us, shown to us by Jesus Christ. Oh, 
Jesus, not a head of feet, but a crown of thorns on his head, and put a purple robe on him to mock him, this so-called king of the Jews. They pretended to greet him as their king. Finally, Pilate brought him before the people. They cried, crucify him, crucify him. If they only knew it was Jesus' love for them that took him to the cross.
Good Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Good Friday. We thank you for the chance we have today. By your grace and your provision. To honor and remember the reason why we are saved today. The reason why we are forgiven. The only means by which we are able to enter your presence without fear and with great joy. You're here to remember Jesus, Christ, and him crucified. May you be exalted, and may he be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. In one collection of writings titled The Highest Good, Scottish pastor and devotional writer Oswald Chambers wrote, We can understand the attributes of God in other ways. But we can only understand the Father's heart in the cross of Christ. There has been some discussion over the years over whether people are saved because Jesus was sympathetic to the sinner's cause or because he was committed to the Father's will. And when we look at the narrative of Scripture, we see over and over again Jesus communicating that he is here. And he's on earth. He's on this path. He has set his face as flint. He has set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem to this moment in time because of his sheer commitment to the Father's will. This is the reason for which Jesus has come. This is the reason for which Jesus was incarnated all those years ago, born in, uh, to a stable to Virgin Mary. All the whole reason why Jesus has come was for this moment. To fulfill the Father's will. To complete what the Father had sent Jesus to do. Jesus wanted to finish the work that the Father had given him to complete. So Jesus, in his, of his own will, desiring and willingly allowed his persecutors to pronounce their guilty verdict on him. So God could pronounce the pardoned verdict on us. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the, Jew, to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went up to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a note, notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Picture this moment for a moment. <laughs> oh, there it is. Look at that. You have to realize that it's not like most of the art pieces that we see or some of the movies that we've seen. A Jesus that's relatively clean, primped up, made up in a makeup studio somewhere for a movie scene. Jesus has just been brutally whipped by the Roman scourge. His flesh torn from his body, possibly exposing some of his bones. And he is forced to stand before Pilate. Just taking one whiplash from one of these Roman soldiers would have been enough to leave me weeping on the floor. But Jesus is forced to stand, broken and bloody, before a mob and before Pilate. This is meant to be humiliating. Pilate is trying to present Jesus as merely a man, not the king that everyone is trying to say he is. This cynical Roman governor is presenting just a mere man before an Israelite mob. And this Israelite mob has already decided that they want him dead. A screaming Jewish crowd shouting to have Jesus crucified. Imagine the sound of people who had just recently, just a week, less than a week ago, had been singing your praises at the city gate, now shouting, crucify him! So Jesus is sent to the hill 
under the supervision of Roman soldiers, Pilate making the final call, knowingly sentencing an innocent Jesus to death by crucifixion. Jesus is nailed to a Roman cross, rejected by his own. The king of the Jews is abandoned to die a worthless criminal, naked and bloodied with no hope of escape. We've all sometimes had that moment when the cost of your decisions became real. You're beginning your first year of college, and you're thinking, ha, this is a piece of cake. And then you find after many, many, many long nights, constant stress, wondering when that next project is going to sweep you out from under you, you wonder if you've made a huge mistake. Maybe you're not cut out for a post-secondary education. You finish up with your honeymoon, and three years into your marriage, you're only beginning to realize how difficult relationship to this person really will be. You go into labor for your first child. You go through the unbearable pain of childbirth after months of only imagining this sort of agony. You begin the process of adopting three children and find out just how much you're going to need to spend. <laughs> That doesn't apply to you guys? Just me. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> well, whatever. You fill in the blank. At some point, the pain, loss, strain, and cost of your chosen life path will catch up with you. Sooner or later, it finally dawns on you. With all of these things combined, we can only begin to scratch the surface of what our Christ is dealing with, of Jesus' ordeal here. This is the no turning back point of Jesus' life story. Nearing, nearing, not quite there, but nearing the pinnacle of the whole narrative of God's redemptive plan for humanity up to this time in history. The moment when the cost of redemption was not fully understood, but was fully realized. That it came down on Jesus today in all pain and shame. A Roman crucifixion was, in fact, not just painful, but also shameful. It's where we get the word excruciating. Just imagine it. You're publicly stripped of your clothes, exposed, insulted, and put to public shame. Your heels and wrists are pierced with nails similar to railroad spikes. Your 165-pound wooden cross is rough wood, probably providing you splinters and abrasions on top of already gaping wounds. Your body fixed in that position over the course of hours prevents you from breathing properly, causing exceeding difficulty with every inhale. You can imagine Jesus, every breath, just using those pierced heels to lift himself up just enough to get that next breath. All of this happening while the people who hate you most in the world laugh, insult, and gloat over your misfortune. The world now regards you as a criminal a wrongdoer, human trash. Your final moments are characterized not by loving family, providing comfort with their gestures and affection around a, a cushy hospital bed, by people rolling dice to see who gets your clothes when you die, while you're mocked and spit on by the people who should have welcomed you with open arms and made you their king. This is the crucifixion of Jesus. All of this takes place with no comfort, no encouragement, and no relief. Even the mild relief offered to Jesus along the way is refused, consistently comforting and encouraging other people along the way, providing for other people's needs. Even while he is st he's stuck there, fixed on a wooden cross, he's helping somebody else. He is doing this utterly alone, with nothing to assuage the pain to the very end. And so the story continues. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. <coughs> when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In Jesus' story, the emphasis is always on fulfilling the will 
of the Father. Especially in the Gospel of John. Here, Jesus is fully obeyed, completed, and fulfilled every command of the Father, every desire of the Father, and every prophecy regarding the work of the Son. He's fulfilled it all. He's done it all. He's finished taken every step. Instead of Adam, back in the garden, failing at the very first step, Jesus has taken not just the first, but the second and the third, and every single one up to this moment absolutely perfectly. Just getting through a week absolutely perfectly, is you get a medal for that kind of stuff. Jesus here has lived his entire life completely obedient, fulfilling every desire of the Father. Here Jesus gets a drink after agonizing for hours on the cross. Some, some scholars would believe that Jesus is doing this so that he could announce the proclamation. There is, a, there is a prophetic element to him asking for this drink, for saying that he's thirsty and be giving this nasty wine drink. It's not even really wine at all. It's just some sort of vinegar mixture. Imagine drinking vinegar. Like, I don't, last time I had vinegar, I almost puked. And here Jesus is drinking it because he's thirsty. But he gets just enough moisture in his throat to proclaim, It is finished! Then he breathes his last. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. We know, the, we know the lines. And he breathes his last. The Greek word, it is finished, is actually just one word for, to, to communicate this phrase. It's tetelestai. Tetelestai. It was really well known among Greeks and Hebrews alike. Among Greeks, it was recognized to be seen on receipts. So if you were to write a, a record for someone that you have fully paid this amount, that, that word, tetelestai, it is finished, would be written on your, your receipt. It was a, basically a way of communicating that this debt is fully paid. So Greek audiences would have recognized this as fully paid. And we see it as the debt that we owe as human beings for sin is paid by Jesus. But every Jewish person would have instantly recognized this Greek word as the equivalent of the Hebrew phrase that was used in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Each year on the Jewish holiday Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the temple, the Holy of Holies, or the Holies, and they would make a special sacrifice for the sins of the people of Israel. As soon as the priest had killed the animal, the process was finished, he would emerge from the place of sacrifice and declare to the waiting crowd, it is finished, in Hebrew. In this sacrifice, all the sins of Israel were placed on the lamb that was killed and punished in their place. Yet the Bible teaches that this sacrificial system was never really complete or finished, because the sacrificial system was really just symbols pointing to the day that we are remembering today, the day when our high priest, our Messiah, Jesus, would proclaim from the cross after spending all his life, it is finished. Sin has been paid for. The past has been paid for. Your wrongs have been paid for. The people have been paid for. The new covenant has been paid for. Jesus was finished his, in his work, but he was finished in death. So we could have complete, unbroken, unending union with God as he has always intended since the beginning. We call Good Friday Good Friday because it's the day that the gospel was put into action. <laughs> the gospel is only made good news because Jesus' life was fully given. Goodness incarnate became evil itself and died. So we, though we are evil, may become the righteousness of God. Later. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus that night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden a new tomb, 
in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
because Good Friday really is a day for reflection, I'm going to ask that as this service ends, that we leave the sanctuary in silence. And why not take some time over the next day and a half to think about what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you? Think about the pain and the shame. Think about the fact that he bled and suffered for my pardon. Think about the demonstration of his love for you and his faithfulness to the will of God. Perhaps you want to just sit for a few moments and reflect on the cross as you think about all of these things that we have heard about this morning. And as you sit and reflect, embrace what the cross stands for and release into God's hands all that holds you back from Him. We do look forward to gathering again on Sunday morning and celebrating the resurrection and all that it means. But for now, let's quietly depart until we gather once more. And until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.